Okay, welcome everybody to the first session of the forum. This year's theme is empowering actions. What better way to kick things off than with our first special session highlighting our grant program and the amazing work our grant recipients have been doing. With that, I'll pass it over to Kendra, who is our first moderator of the day. Kendra is our partnership and grants coordinator, so she has been completely immersed in our grant program and is a big part of its success. Um, thanks so much, Kendra. I'll pass it over to you now. Thank you very much, Maddie, for that warm welcome. I'd also like to thank you, Mr. Smith and Sarah Rang, for your great welcome and introduction to the Invasive Species Forum. We are extremely grateful to the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry for their generous contributions towards fighting invasive species in Ontario. As more than 80 projects wrap up, great gains earned through the implementing projects in the fiscal year of 2024. Thanks to their investment of $500,000, we were able to grow our long-running microgrant program into the more comprehensive Invasive Species Action Fund, or ISAF. This new program was able to support two new streams of projects that tackled projects of greater scope. ISAF far exceeded our expectations through both the number of applications received, leaving us well oversubscribed, but able to fund 64 high-quality projects. Uh, the MNRF also invested an additional $250,000 to help combat invasive phragmites throughout the province. Throughout this investment, we were able to support more than two dozen, two dozen on the ground products from across the province to help stop the spread of this aggressive plant. The Invasive Phragmites Control Fund was oversubscribed by 75%, highlighting the need for these programs and our communities. Overall, the ISC was thrilled with the quality and volume of organizations applying to both funds. We saw applications coming in from municipalities, conservation authorities, indigenous groups, community-based groups, and other NGOs from all corners of the province. For this special session, we are very pleased to showcase four grant recipients, two from the Invasive Species Action Fund and two from the Invasive Phragmites Control Fund, who are here today to give presentations highlighting the great work the funds have empowered them to do. This session will then wrap with a presentation from the Invasive Species Centre as we provide an advanced look at the planning for our opening of the next ISAF cycle. As Mr. As Minister Smith indicated, we'll open on March 6th of 2024. We're going to start by hearing from two of our Invasive Phragmites Control recipients first, followed by two Invasive Species Action Fund recipients. Um, if you have any questions throughout their presentations, please do add them to the Q&A, and if you have time at the end, we will try and address those for you. Our first presenter is Nicole Carpenter from Georgia Bay Forever, who will be giving us an overview of their project, uh, Protecting Critical Wetland Assets Through Invasive Removals. Thank you, Nicole. Thanks, Kendra. Um, I heard there was a little bit of an echo, so hopefully... Um, Please stop me if uh, if mine uh, is echoing as well, but uh, if not, I'm just going to get started. Okay, <clears throat> hi everyone. I'm Nicole and I'm the Science Projects Manager at Georgian Bay Forever. And I'm here to talk to you about our community-based approach to management of Phragmites for the help of water and wetlands. I'd like to thank everyone for listening and for the Invasive Species Center for hosting today and the wonderful Invasive Phragmites Control Fund um, that has helped us achieve a lot of success in our projects. Georgian Bay Forever is a charity dedicated to scientific research and public education on Georgian Bay's aquatic ecosystem. Our mission is to protect, enhance, and restore the aquatic ecosystem of Georgian Bay for future generations by taking action and funding accredited research on water levels, water quality, and ecosystems. This presentation will highlight the methods, progress, and success of our community-based invasive phragmites management across the southeastern Georgian Bay coast. Georgian Bay is amongst the most diverse ecosystems in the Great Lakes composed of incredibly complex habitats. Protecting the plants and animals that uh, make the bay what it is today also protects the thousands of people that rely on it for clean drinking water, recreation, and food. Our Invasive Frangwinnies program has seen many years of challenges and success in Georgian Bay. I wanna note uh, that 
Georgian Bay Forever, we do manual removal, and uh, we are really focusing on aquatic Phragmites growth, which involves using the cut to drown method. Um, but we are also using spading when necessary, especially now that we're seeing lower water levels in Georgian Bay. Our work began 11 years ago when we quickly became aware of the need for Phragmites education and control across Georgian Bay. In 2019, we developed a five-year community-based control plan for nearly 600 stands that were originally identified along the coasts of three municipalities. One of the key components to success of this program is collaborating with volunteers, municipalities, First Nations, and community groups all around Georgian Bay to create community leaders to undertake Phragmites monitoring and control, which will lead to a sustainable method of environmental management. A large part of this plan is to, awful, to also offer uh, summer employment to local students each year to assist in the program and spread education and awareness throughout the community. Um, and they really take on the role of tackling large, difficult to access sites. Um, these are sites that the community uh, and volunteers are often not able to, um, to get to themselves. So uh, since 2019, we've nearly doubled the number of stands under our management to 1,020 and uh, really increased our community involvement. So now we have five municipalities uh, supporting us. Uh, we started with three and we've maintained those three through, through the course of the five years. These pie charts demonstrate the success we've had. So red represents sites left untreated. Uh, yellow represents sites that are cut each year, and then uh, green are sites that are seeing zero regrowth and we continue to monitor. This is all accomplished by training community groups who can then spread knowledge and manage the Phragmites properly on their own within their community, allowing us to refocus our efforts to new communities. So that um, so at the end of the five years, uh, we're kind of at that point now, uh, we're not finished, but um, it really is because we have added so many, um, so many more uh, people and sites and uh, areas into our project. But uh, this year we put 400 uh, in at 490 into that monitoring stage and we cut over 200 stands, which equated to over 20,000 meters squared of uh, Phragmites patches. 300 community members were educated, 15 events uh, were attended slash hosted by GBF, and uh, we hosted six additional training workshops around the community. Um, a trend that we have noticed, and I think many people notice this as well, uh, our northern communities tend to have less Phragmites because the spread is less rapid and the coast is predominantly Canadian shield, so not really ideal for Phragmites. Um, but we know it still uh, it still finds its way to establish wherever. Communities further south have a higher density of Phragmites to deal with, as seen on the map here. So all of that red at the bottom. Our staff and summer students spend most of their time working in the southern areas, and this is to help decrease the size and number of these sites, um, hopefully making it more manageable for the local community. Once we get to a point um, where the community can manage it on its own, that's when we are able to relocate our efforts. Uh, the main reason for success uh, here, though, is the dedication of these communities and the persistency to monitor and remove invasive Phragmites each year. So, for example, we have cottage associations up in the archipelago um, who have been doing this uh, for the course of our 10 plus year project. Um, each year, we also strive to enhance our mapping capabilities to help track changes over time, fill data gaps, and analyze trends in Phragmites. We make a publicly available map that allows users to navigate the region and click on sites to learn more about them. So that map I showed in the last slide, um, that is, uh, there's a link to it that you can uh, click on and um, community members can actually go in and take a look at any data that's collected with that, um, with that specific point. Uh, we've also begun surveying for Phragmites with the use of a multi-spectral drone, and this was really to help with accessibility and limiting the disturbance to sensitive wetlands. And I just want to quickly thank uh, Curtis Avery from Nipissing First Nation. Um, him and his team are doing very similar work on Lake Nipissing, and it really helped spark the idea for our team. So we've only begun the initial stages of this work, uh, conducting flights and preliminary processing and analysis. 
Uh, much more is to be done and will be done over the summer of 2024. But here you can see uh, kind of a mosaic image where we were um, searching for Phragmites and you can see it overlaying with a uh, kind of an old satellite image. image um, and you can see the difference in that spatial resolution, which will help us identi hopefully identify invasive Phragmites growing in, in habitat. Um, we're able to create vegetation indices such as um, the NDVIs um, or soil adjusted vegetation index uh, here to look at health of vegetation. But taking all of these things, putting it together, um, our goal is to use deep learning tools to specifically identify Phragmites apart from other vegetation using drone surveying and doing this from year to year. Thank you for listening. Feel free to reach out. Um, my email is not on uh, on here, but I can put it in the, the Q&A. Um, if there's anyone with familiarity on vegetation classification using multispectral imagery and deep learning, um, I would ask that you please reach out or if you have any experience with drone mapping for invasive species, I would love to hear from you. Um, so thank you and that's it. Excellent. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you so much, Nicole. That was great. Uh, up next, we have our second presenter, Jessie McFadden. She is from the Lakehead Region Conservation Authority, and she'll be talking to us today about their project, the 2023-24 Thunder Bay Regional Phragmites Collaboration. Thanks, Jessie. Thanks, Kendra. Uh, let me know if there's any issues uh, with my presentation and I will dive right in. My name is Jesse McFadden and I'm the watershed biologist here at Lakehead Region Conservation Authority and I'm very excited to get to share a glimpse of Northern Ontario Phragmites with you all today as well as hear from so many experts across the province about their experience managing Phragmites. Um, quite similar, I'm sure, to other Phragmites working groups and collaboratives in the province, Thunder Bay Regional Phragmites Collaborative has brought together a dedicated group of environmental organizations, resource management experts, and concerned citizens to share updates and resources on the status of Phragmites in our area. Unique, perhaps, to Thunder Bay and other parts of Northern Ontario is the situation we find ourselves in on the front end of the curve. And what I mean by that is in Thunder Bay, we are at what you might call a defensive stage in our management. Only in recent years has Phragmites established itself up here. And so far, it's mostly limited to roadways, harbour ports, rail lines, and ditches. Uh, and so a large part of our efforts over the past two years of the collaboration has been mapping Phragmites and finding it. I suspect that having a map that looks like this one is a refreshing thought to most in Southern Ontario, instead of entire stretches of roadside ditches overwhelmed by monocultures of the species, we still have manageable stands, mostly less than half a hectare in size. Um, but what we lack up here in the North is uh, some awareness and um, the ability to track its spread through on the ground surveys just due to the vastness of wilderness in the region. One of Thunder Bay's best qualities, of course, is uh, adding difficulties to the fight against Phragmites, the vast expenses of lesser traveled wilderness, forest for miles, um, without human settlements is something cherished by most up here, but it makes it hard to know the limits of Phragmites spread. Um, we're also home up here in the north to most of Ontario's remaining intact wetlands, making the prevention and further spread of Phragmites even more important. We are incredibly pleased here at the Conservation Authority to have assembled such a resourceful group to help champion Phragmites management in the region. Um, the effective management at this stage of the game of every single known stand is incredibly important and worthwhile. The case studies of invasive Phragmites aggressive spread in the rest of the province certainly provides uh, incentive for action in the north. And so far, we've been able to manage 13 stands 
um, that have been treated and over 35 different groups and local biologists have assembled to help track, monitor and manage Phragmites. Uh, we've also partnered with our local Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry office, uh, who has generously donated or supported management initiatives through funds and resources. And at this stage, uh, we're emphasizing the importance of getting the word out about this work into the community, spreading the word through posters, uh, news articles, radio ads whenever we can, and presentations uh, is a focus, ongoing focus in our work. Um, because again, we need we need that boots on the ground help to be able to survey the entire region for Phragmites. As many habitats that would happily host species are not readily accessible and need off-road vehicles to access them. So we're hoping uh, to engage anglers and hunters to help take on some of this monitoring with more of a community science perspective. This year, the Thunder Bay Regional Phragmites Collaborative is planning targeted surveys using aerial imagery to narrow down areas to survey by foot. So for example, wetlands that are near to major roadways where Phragmites is known to occur um, would be targeted for further on the ground surveys. Another consideration, perhaps unique in the North in the fight against Frag, um, is that amongst the vast amounts of wetlands remaining up here in the North, native Phragmites, Phragmites australis subspecies americanus exists quite happily. In the first year of the collaborative, we mapped 51 stands of Phragmites, but only 12 of those were confirmed as invasive Phragmites. We differentiated between the two subspecies using a combination of field marks, measurements, and DNA test kits provided by the Invasive Species Center um, when we weren't sure based on field marks alone. Given the widespread occurrence of native Phragmites in the region, we've also wondered about the potential of hybridization. Hybrid Phragmites often show intermediate morphological characteristics, stem characteristics more indicative of native Phragmites with growth patterns more similar to invasive Phragmites. So these photos and iNaturalist posts just um, give an example of that. And this was done unintentionally, but you can see here that the same stand in the same location based strictly on morpho morphology alone was identified as invasive in 2022 and native in 2023 by the various uh, naturalists and plant ID experts. Um, realizing, of course, that hybridization is fairly uncommon. The examples in New York and Las Vegas and our unique situation up here in Thunder Bay has us interested in looking more into this. So moving into 2024, the Thunder Bay Regional Phragmites Collaborative would like to continue researching potential hybridization in the region, assessing other case studies and gaining access to more DNA analysis. Um, we hope to continue learning from Southern Ontario's experience, maybe even experimenting with a preventative approach wherever possible. Uh, and of course, continued surveying, mapping, and management of stands as our top priority. We are, on behalf of the Conservation Authority and all the members of the Thunder Bay Regional Phragmites Collaborative, we are beyond grateful to the Invasive Species Center for their ongoing support. Um, and if you do have an experience that you think we'd benefit from hearing about up here in the north on the front end of the curve, maybe something you'd hope that you could have done differently, something you'd like to share, please do not hesitate to reach out. My info is at the bottom of the screen. Thank you very much, Jesse. That was great. Uh, we're now going to hear from a couple of our ISAF recipients whose projects tackled invasive species other than invasive Phragmites. And I would first like to welcome Nigel Akomiak from the uh, Tikamikshang Anishinaabek, who will be taking us through their project, Reversing the Spread of Invasive Species in a Tikamikshang Anishinaabek. Thank you, Kendra. Um... I hope everyone can see my screen already. Right. 
Good afternoon. My name is Nigel Lee Komiak. I am the Species at Risk Coordinator for Tigmish Anishinaabek. I've been with the organization for almost two years now. <clears throat> I'm here to today to tell you about a Tikmashing's project through the Invasive Species Action Fund, which we titled Reversing the Spread of Invasive Species in a Tikmashing and Anishinaabek. So first off, the Tikmashing and Anishinaabek First Nation is located in Naughton, Ontario, west of the city of Sudbury, about a 15 minute drive. For our project, we decided to focus on tackling Japanese knotweed. Uh, Japanese knotweed is an established invasive species in a Tikmashing, and it has a strong presence in the Panache cottage lease lots, uh, the area where Tikmashing leases out land to cottages. The species was introduced to a Tikmashing by cottage lot leases. Like most places, the plant was brought in as an ornamental plant, but it was also brought in as a means of privacy, basically acting as a fence when populations became dense. Unaware of how out of control it could get, leases would end up trimming the overgrown plants and dumping the plant material in the bush nearby which just encouraged it to spread further. Here you can see some trimmings with um, a bit of knotweed growing around it. We used the best management practices for Japanese knotweed to plan the methods for our project. Um, it was a very useful document when I was writing the application. They have best management practices for quite a few species. And I would recommend using these documents uh, as much as possible when making an invasive species project. The methods we came up with were fairly simple. Cutting the plant and disposing of plant material in thick black plastic bags. The plastic bags were then left out in uh, in an area that gets direct sunlight, we would leave them there for two to three weeks to kill off the rhizomes. Um, populations were monitored for regrowth, and the process was repeated once again once the once the plants reached a mature height. The goal behind repeated cutting is to help weaken the root system. And after repeated cuttings, the plants would be sprayed with herbicides to shock the system. Since the main area we were working in was along a frequently traveled road, we decided to put up signs and pylons as a safety precaution. The cutting was done with a simple pair of shears. Plants were cut near the base of the stem since cutting the plant's roots can encourage it to spread. Uh, we found that there were was too much plant material and it was too time consuming to bag it all. So we ended up replacing our plastic bags with black tarps and wrapped it up like big tobacco ties in this uh, ATV trailer here. One of the most notable outcomes of the project was improved road safety. We had quite a few comments from a handful of uh, cottage lot leases thanking us for taking care of the problem. It was also nice to see beginning steps taken towards getting rid of this plant from the community. And we raised awareness within the community about this invasive species. Some of the conflicts that we came into with this project were administrative delays. I found by the time we got the project started, we were already well into the growing season. Uh, we also had to get permission from Chief and Cancel to carry out this project, since using herbicides in our tick machine is against our policy. And overall, um, we underestimated how long it would take to clear out 
the Japanese not lead. It was a, a bigger drop than we expected. It felt like we were clearing out a little forest. Our future plans are to turn this project into a multi-year project. Eventually, we plan to replenish the soil and plant native species where Japanese knotweed was cleared out. And we would like to expand our capacity to manage other invasive species within the community. Thank you, Mikwich Nekamik. Thank you very much, Nigel Miguetch. Um, next up, we are going to be hearing from Lindsay Champagne from the Yanaraska Region Conservation Authority, who will be telling us about their project, the GFC Revitalization, Building Long-Term Resili Resiliency to HWA BLD and Other Invasive Species Within a Forest Management Context. Thank you, Kendra. I'm just going to share my slides here. Oh my goodness. All right, hopefully everybody can see that all right. Um, good afternoon. My name is Lindsay Champagne, and I'm the watershed biologist at the Ganaraska Re Region Conservation Authority. Uh, myself and the Ganaraska Region Conservation Authority forester worked very closely together on this project to build long term resiliency to hemlock woolly adelgid beech leaf disease, and other invasive species in the Ganaraska Forest Center. Um, to, give you a, <clears throat> to give you a little bit of context uh, to this project, it's important to know that the Ganaraska Region Conservation Authority manages the Ganaraska Forest, which is an 11,000 acre red pine plantation and mixed wood forest. The GRCA manages the forest using sustainable silvicultural practices that are outlined in the Ganaraska Region uh, Forest Management Plan. The main forest management objective is to manage for a healthy, resilient, functional forest ecosystem and to manage towards eventual conversion to a natural pine oak mixed wood forest. This project was a continuation of a revitalization of the Ganaraska Forest um, Center Trailhead, which was actually a project in 2022 through the Invasive Species Action Fund microgrant uh, strain. Uh, this project uh, aimed at building long-term resiliency to hemlock willy adelgid and beech leaf disease through surveying and understory thinning. The GRCA is building uh, resiliency to beech leaf disease and hemlock woolly adelgid through understory tending in a plantation compartment adjacent to where the microgrant project had taken place. This will promote the growth and retention of healthy trees, uh, beech trees and hemlock trees in the regenerating plantation. This project has also targeted other invasive species that have colonized the understory, including mass amounts of buckthorn, autumn olive, invasive honeysuckle, burning bush, and Scots pine. The removal of these invasive species will help to improve the understory growth <clears throat> for hemlock and beech, along with many other desirable native species. Um, the action side of this project consisted of invasive species removal for a 9.1 acre forest compartment. Um, when looking at this compartment, you can see that it is broken up into four different areas. <clears throat> um, areas one through three were completely treated for invasive shrubs. And the west side of the trail, which is marked in green um, in area four was also completely removed. Originally, the plan was to basal bark this area with garlon. Um, however, during the time of the project, garlon was on back order, and we had to be a little bit creative with our uh, treatments. We conducted three different treatment methods, and we're going to use them as pilot projects to review their efficacy that we can implement in uh, future projects. So 1.5 acres of this compartment was basal barked with uh, Garlon RTU, which came from our original stash that we had on hand. 3.5 acres was cut and stump treated with uh, Roundup Weathermax. And then when Garlon was available, the remaining 4.1 hectare acres, sorry, uh, was cut and stump treated with Garlon XRT. 
Um, area one had mild infestation and we are actually going to go forward with doing some planting of white pine this year, while the remaining sections are going to require further treatment cycles, but due to the help of the Invasive Species Action Fund, GRCA has built internal capacity to tackle these uh, future treatments as well as other um, treatments on our own. As you can see from these images, the cut and stump treatments that were kind of thrust upon us um, allowed for a very nice visual, um, visual appearance, which makes it very dramatic and impactful when visitors come to uh, view this area. So beech leaf disease was first uh, discovered in the Ganaraska forest in September of 2022. And the GRCA forester wanted to ensure that we were very proactive with surveying and early detection and prevention. Uh, 70 kilometers of trail side forest was um, surveyed with eight new instances being observed. The sightings were recorded and reported to MNRF for their records and also put on our records as well. Little is, little is known or available regarding the best management practices for beech leaf disease. However, through discussion with MNRF, we found out that research in New York had been conducted thinning of beech leaf, disease pro, beech leaf disease prone areas to reduce the favorable habitat for that pesky nematode. The nematode prefers humid, damp, thick understories. Therefore, by thinning those areas, the favorable conditions are reduced by that increased airflow. However, the area that we thinned um, was not an area containing beech leaf disease, and therefore it's going to be used as a preventative strategy. With the detection of hemlock woolly adelgid in Ontario, early detection surveys were prioritized to see if the Ganaraska forest was a subject of this new invasive species. Visual inspections were conducted in 15 stands, which equates to 139.1 hectares um, that contain substantial amounts of hemlock trees. Additionally, we partnered with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency to monitor for the hemlock woolly adelgid using um, eDNA traps. Fortunately, um, no hemlock woolly adelgid was uh, discovered in our forest during the survey period, which is very exciting. Um, Understory management of the hemlock followed uh, the early hemlock woolly adelgid silvicultural management recommendations that are provided by the MNRF. And the objective was to build resiliency by lightly releasing the hemlocks uh, to improve their growing conditions. As a result of the invasive species shrub removal, 40 of the hem 40 hemlocks in the area were lightly released and got a better fighting chance. Like many projects, we had a few small barriers. Uh, the main barrier that we encountered was the lack of hemlock, or the lack of garlon, sorry. Um, with the lack of garlon, we decided to cut and stump treat with Roundup Weathermax. While Weathermax offered a more cost-effective herbicide option with low application volumes, it actually introduced a challenge in terms of increased labor intensity. Um, since Weathermax requires applications within a narrow five minute window, uh, more staffers required on hand, as well as um, we needed to cut the, um, the shrubs, which we hadn't planned on, um, move the shrubs out of the way, and also point out those freshly cut stumps that needed to be treated still. Uh, despite this adjustment, the project successfully managed uh, the invasive species while allowing a, for a more dramatic visual change. The overall contributions of this project are much larger than just the removal of the 9.1 acres of invasive species and the releasing of 40 hemlock trees. This project has prompted the GRCA staff to integrate similar projects into their standard operating procedures. It has helped build internal capacity through the purchasing of equipment and the increased experience and expertise in invasive species management. Um, with the hiccup of not having Garlon, it enhanced our preparedness and planning, which will translate into other projects throughout our organization and through other organizations who can learn from this. Um, the most important, though, is by incorporating invasive species management into our regular forest management, it contributes to the overall improvements of forests, of our forest, and increases its long-term resiliency not only to invasive species, but to disease and climate change. Aside from the special thank you to the MNRF 
um, through the Invasive Species Action Fund. I wanted to shout out to our staff that we have on hand. Without them, it would not have been possible, as well as our summer students who were out doing long surveys. And then Sharon Reed from um, the Research Centre in uh, as a part of the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry for helping us with the best management practices for both beech leaf disease and hemlock, Willie Adelgid. Uh, I know that was very fast, so if anybody has any questions, please feel free to reach out to me and I'll share my contact information in the comments. Um, thank you so much and definitely take advantage of this program because it is phenomenal. Um, thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you very much, Lindsay. It's Colin Casson here. I'm going to cut in because uh, we're a little tight on time here. So I want to thank Kendra for moderating the session as I get queued up and ready to go here. Uh, and thank the other three speakers, in addition to Lindsay, for presenting some great, uh, excellent positive outcomes that were achieved this year uh, through the Invasive Species Action Fund. So uh, let's jump in. Uh, I am sharing screen. Okay, good. Hopefully you can see. Uh, Kendra, please jump in if not. Um, so just a couple updates. Uh, wow, what a response to the summer of invasives that we experienced last year that Sarah mentioned off the top. And thank you to the 80 groups who are busy implementing projects. You've got a few days left, so keep up the great work as you finish up and, and report out. I wanted to thank, of course, the Minister uh, and the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry for their investment this year uh, of $500,000 into our Invasive Species Action Fund program and a quarter of a million dollars through the Invasive Phragmites Control Fund. So $750,000 being spent very well achieving uh, on the ground uh, outcomes this year. So really excited to see that. And of course, uh, a big thank you to everybody in the 80 recipients uh, and project implementers who were, were busy on the landscape all summer, all fall, and even a, a few projects going into winter. Great work and thank you very much for your hard efforts. Um, I've got some good news. The, the, as the minister said, uh, we're very excited to be launching uh, and starting to accept call for proposals as of March 6th, 2024. So this is the Ontario specific granting program uh, that is all species except for Agmites. We're very excited to launch as of March 6th this year. So uh, this is my job uh, in the back end of this relay is to give you a little bit of quick information on what's to come. Um, so uh, first things first, we're looking at um, about a five week intake period that's gonna start as of March 6th. Uh, as the minister said, we've got three grant streams, uh, same as last year, similar caps as, as last year as well. So micro grants, two and a half thousand, a $10,000 accelerated impact cap, and a transformative action stream at a $50,000 cap. Um, term is is again going to be kind of the spring into this time next year and in terms of our priorities you're going to have to wait until March 6th to understand what specific priorities but as a bit of an early uh, nudge just want to note that I think they're going to be very comparable to last year so micro grants we're looking to support uh, community-led projects all across the province on a wide range of species and on accelerated impact and transformative action, those higher tier uh, caps, we're looking for species such as those regulated under the Invasive Species Act. So keep an eye to those Ontario regulations for a bit of a, a, a early understanding of what's to come in terms of priority species. Um, the other change that's going to happen this upcoming year once we launch uh, in just uh, a few short days is we're going to continue with what we've been doing last year, that optional webinar series. We found great feedback from proponents last year. So there are some early dates here. I'll put them in the chat as well because I know we're tight on time. I just wanted to let you know there's going to be some general information sessions to help you understand the guidebook a little bit more and uh, some of the terms we're trying to put, as well as a couple other special interest ones that were available by request. So tips on how to develop a budget, if developing a budget is new for you in this kind of a framework. Happy to help uh, walk you through it a little bit and then calculating in-kind contributions as well. So we're going to be using an online grant portal this year just to make it a little bit easier to put, put all your documents into one place. Uh, so would welcome everyone to check that out. And where can you learn a little bit more about this launch? Again, we're going to launch on March 6th. So you've got a little bit of time to start dreaming up projects now and working with partners to develop those projects. And you can stay up to speed by visiting invasivespeciescenter.ca backslash grants. And why not sign up for the uh, email notification so you will truly be the first to know once we launch. Um, and also follow us on social media. We'll be happily sharing information uh, right in advance of March 6th once we're ready to go live with a launch. So really wanted to thank all the uh, proponents this year and also those great projects that are being implemented right now. And thank uh, Kendra for moderating a great session and looking forward to the next session in uh, just one minute time. So thanks everybody and uh, enjoy the rest of the forum. Thanks Colin and thanks Kendra for moderating and to all of our other speakers. It's 
so great to hear about all your amazing work. Uh, make sure to tune in to our next session starting right now, um, which is part one of our education, outreach, and community 